we live in a world with degeneracy pressure, right? The very basic idea that no two fermions, and fermions are a kind of particle like an electron, like a proton or a neutron, no two fermions can occupy the exact same quantum state. They can't have identical spin positions, energy levels, et cetera, et cetera. What does this give us? Well, I don't know, it gives us atoms. If you have electrons surrounding an atomic nucleus, not all of them can pile into the nice compact ground state. They actually have to go and extend out further and create shells, that's kind of nice. It gives us uh, metals. Metals are nice and strong from this degeneracy pressure. Uh, it gives us metallic hydrogen. We've talked about metallic hydrogen before in the cores of gas giants. And it gives us degenerate states of matter. Things like white dwarfs or neutron stars and possibly quark stars. And the reason we get a degeneracy pressure is the fact that even if you take, say you have a, a gas, a blob of electrons, and you cool that gas down. Normally that gas is supported. It's supported from collapse by its own pressure, by the fact that the electrons are zipping all around. But you cool that down, you bring that temperature down, that pressure lessens and lessens and lessens, and the blob of electrons compresses down into a tight little ball. Let's say, just play pretend, you bring that ball of electrons down to pure absolute zero. I know you can't, but let's just play pretend you would think that at absolute zero pressure, the ball of electrons would collapse into a singularity, but it doesn't because there's an additional source of pressure. And that's from the source that is sourced by degeneracy pressure. All the electrons want to cram into that zero temperature ground state, but they can't because no two fermions can share the same quantum state. So they can't. They just can't. So they're forced to go into higher energy levels. And so they actually, they take up space. They take up more energy. They're not all at zero energy, even at zero temperature. There is some energy, some fundamental quantum energy associated with that system, even though there's no temperature there. And that provides a source of pressure. You can't squeeze it any further because the electrons don't have anywhere to go. They're like, we're all full here. We can't go down to any lower energy levels. Keep trying to squeeze us, we're just not going to. Now, another way to think about this, if you want to think about it, and I've used this analogy before, is to look at it, look at it in terms of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where you can't measure the position and the velocity of a particle with an equal amount of precision. The more you measure a particle's position, the less you know about its velocity and vice versa. Well, when it comes to the case of degenerate matter, where we say we have a bunch of electrons packed together, if they're really, really, really packed together, then each individual electron is just occupying a tiny, tiny little cell, like a little tiny patch of volume. That means we know it's positioned really, really well because it's, it's right there. It's like crammed into that tiny ball. Where else is it gonna be? But that means, because its position is known very, 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 very well, that its velocity is not known very well. And it can potentially have an incredibly high velocity. So you can imagine as you're trying to squeeze down an electron into a smaller and smaller region of space, it starts vibrating, it starts buzzing like crazy, like banging against the cells, the walls of the cell you're trying to put it in. The tighter it goes, the, the, the crazier it gets. And that vibration, that, that energy, that movement feels like pressure. You, you like try to cram it down and the electron is fighting you. And the more you try to cram it down, the more the electron frightens you, fights you. Now, that's, and so that's a, a totally equivalent way to look at this situation. So you can't cram electrons down as tight as you would prefer. And when this happens in nature, we get a white dwarf. A white dwarf is yeah, about the mass of our sun crammed into something about the size of the earth. And it's supported in large part by the degeneracy pressure of electrons. But we know that if you take a star and one of these white dwarfs and increase its mass too much beyond about 1.4 times the mass of the sun, that will overwhelm. 
the degeneracy pressure. Even the degeneracy pressure of these electrons that are able to resist, able to put up this fight of this pressure, they can't go on forever. You can overwhelm them. And when Subramanian and Chandrasekhar first figured all this out, by the way, an amazing story of this uh, incredible physicist. If you'd like to learn more, please ask about him. I'd love to go into his story. When he first figured this out, that white dwarfs can be supported by degeneracy pressure, but there is a point at which they collapse. They didn't know like what it would collapse into. Now we know, now we know more about nuclear physics and we realize that some of the electrons can get shoved into any remaining protons, convert those into neutrons, and it becomes a neutron star, which is itself supported by the degeneracy pressure of neutrons. So now you've taken an object, uh, instead of having a, a, a solar mass worth of stuff in the size of a planet like an Earth, now it's a solar or one or two, or maybe even in some cases three times the mass of the sun crammed into the size of a city, like seriously like 10 kilometers across. And that's because neutrons are much more massive, uh, so they can be crammed down much more tightly than electrons, so you get a much more tighter, dense ball. Now, if you can overwhelm that, and that's pretty hard to do, but it's not impossible. Gravity is gravity, and gravity is pretty dang strong and can even overwhelm this neutron degeneracy pressure. That happens at about the two or three solar mass threshold. Not quite sure on that number because nuclear physics is kind of hard, and we don't have everything cleared out. Um, we don't have a good, really good understanding we don't have a, a really good understanding of nuclear physics. We have a pretty solid one, but in this case, when it comes to neutron stars, things get a little bit hairy. But we know that it can be overwhelmed. And so you ask, what happens next? If I were to overwhelm the degeneracy pressure of a neutron star, can I push this thing any further? What does it become? Well, our current best guess is a black hole, that there's nothing left to, to fight against gravity and it just, collapses into a singularity, becomes a black hole. Maybe, most likely, most likely. I mean, when you take an atom and you deconstruct it, you shove the electrons into the protons, you just get a whole bunch of neutrons. But neutrons themselves are made of something smaller, something called quarks. Particles like protons and neutrons are really bags of particles, of these smaller particles called quarks. There are six of them that we call uh, up, down, top, bottom, strange, and charm. If you look at a proton, that's a couple ups and a down. Mix together three of them together to make a proton. If you have two downs and an up, you get a neutron. You get various other combinations. You get all sorts of crazy exotic particles. Well, quarks are fermions, and they're smaller than neutrons. So can you collapse things to a point where you disassociate the neutrons, where they, they're broken apart, and you just have a whole bunch of quarks all swimming around together in a giant ball that are supported by their very own degeneracy pressure that prevent further collapse. And in this case, we would call it a quark star, just like we call it a neutron star. Maybe, maybe, I mean, this is something we don't fully understand uh, about fundamental physics. It's because in the core of a neutron star at the high temperatures and high pressures, we don't fully understand the nuclear physics of what's going on. And when it comes to quarks, we, we understand some things about quarks, but we don't understand how they would behave in this case. Like we can manufacture quarks all over the place in, in particle colliders, but quarks have this weird property, this quark of the quark, that they must be confined, that free individual quarks just aren't a thing. They always bind up together to make larger particles. So when we smash up atoms or do whatever we wanna do in particle colliders, we don't get individual, we don't get like a spray of quarks, we get a spray of clumps of quarks. So it's very, very hard to study quarks by themselves. We can only see them in combination with other stuff. And the mathematics gets like super duper crazy when we're trying to study quarks in this weird state of matter. So experimentally, we don't have a lot to go on because we can't just like look at a quark and ask it how it's feeling. 
and theoretically we can't make a lot of progress because we the physics are so complicated the math is so tough that we don't really understand how quarks would behave okay so there isn't a lot of theoretical motivation for a quark star are there any observational motivation for a quark star is there anything funny going on in the universe that could be explained by a quark star well kind of sort of there's some neutron stars that look a little bit fishy that might be a little bit too dense a little bit too massive uh, to really be comfortably called a neutron star there's this gap between the most massive neutron star we see and the least massive black hole we see so we know black holes are out there uh, and we know neutron stars are out there but they there's this gap between about two and three solar masses where we don't see anybody Maybe that gap is filled by quark stars. They would fit the bill. Or maybe it's just an observational thing because you know it's hard to see small black holes and maybe big neutron stars are rare. So we just haven't done astronomy for long enough to really see it. Uh, it's a little bit tough. Maybe these neutron stars that look a little bit too heavy, maybe we just don't understand neutron stars all that well which is like a very real possibility there's some complicated physics happening especially in the core so observationally there's not a lot to go on theoretically there's not so much to go on uh is there any what would a quark star do how would it behave is there any observational hook is there anything we can point to and say aha that's the unique signature for a quark star well, we know that we can, shouldn't say no, we, we pretty much figure that if you were to take, make a quark star out of the most common kinds of quarks up and down, these would be incredibly unstable. That if you were to manufacture one deep in space made of up and down quarks, which is what protons and neutrons are made of, it would basically immediately dissolve. They're not the most stable things around. But if you make it out of strange quarks, uh, one of the six kinds of quarks that aren't so common, there are possibly some stable configurations where you can flood a quark star with enough of these strange quarks and actually maybe make it stable and have it live a long, nice, productive life and fight against the inevitable crush of gravity. Maybe kind of, sort of. That opens up some questions like how the heck are you going to produce enough strange quarks in time because strange quarks don't last very long and they're kind of weird and exotic. So what is your astrophysical mechanism for making them? We know how neutrons can be, can be made. How are we going to make a bunch of strange quarks? And will this look any different than a neutron star from far away from like super many 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 light years away how do you tell the difference between a quark star and a neutron star not exactly sure so theoretically there's not a lot a strong case for strange stars for quark stars and observationally there's not a lot of you know movement there's it's not like the universe is saying hey everyone there are things called strange stars or quark stars so i would give the existence of quark stars a week maybe a week maybe where yes it's technically allowed might be technically allowed say once we fully understand all this nuclear quark business kind of maybe technically allowed but maybe just nature just doesn't make them because maybe nature isn't as interested in them as we are which has happened before so thank you so much for watching hope you enjoyed please click the like button and subscribe and go to patreon.com slash pm sutter so i can keep making these videos and we can keep uh exploring all this crazy stuff that the universe doesn't care about i guess but we care about and that's what matters see you next time